I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is Stuart Englert, veteran journalist and author of a number of books, including Rigged, Exposing the Largest Financial Fraud in History. Just a reminder before we get started, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Stuart, thank you so much for being here online with me once again. It's great to be back, uh, Charlotte. I guess it's been about six months since we last spoke. And uh, I understand you, you want to talk, uh, talk about uh, Basel III today. That's right. That was one of the questions that we had in the comments of that interview. Previously, somebody asked if we could have you back to discuss this topic. So, of course, happy to oblige and happy to have you here. Sure. I think, well, yeah. I will tell you I, that, you know, it's, it's a complex issue. And uh, I have to preface it by saying, you know, I'm going to approach this from, from a layman's perspective. Yeah, and I think that'll be great. This is actually our first time discussing it on our channel. So we're going to start really basic and hopefully try to explain it in terms that everybody can understand. So yeah, the first question I think we could start with is if you could give a brief overview of what Basel III actually is and explain how and why it was developed. Sure, Charlotte. Well, uh, the Basel III Accord is a set of banking standards that are designed to improve uh, balance sheets and reduce the systemic risk in the global financial system. Uh, the standards were introduced after the collapse of uh, Bear Stearns and uh, Lehman Brothers, which triggered the 2007-2008 financial crisis. Uh, the rules were written by a supervisory committee of the Bank for International Settlements, also known as the BIS, which is based in Basel, Switzerland, hence the name Basel III. Uh, the, uh, the rules were written for 28 of the world's central banks, um, and Basel III follows Basel I and Basel II, uh, which uh, came into effect in uh, 1988 and 2004, um, which also established uh, bank capital requirements. The BIS, by the way, is commonly known as the central bank of central banks. All right. Now, so we know that it came about because of the 2008-2009 financial crisis. So why are we starting to hear more about Basel III this year? What important dates do we have approaching? And you know, there have been some delays previously, so what's going on there? Sure. Well, much has been written and, and spoken about lately uh, about this accord, particularly in uh, precious metal circles, because of an approaching June 28th rule change. Uh, the rule is called, called the net stable funding ratio, or NSF ratio. And it changes the way that banks classify assets and liabilities, or at least potential uh, liabilities on their balance sheets. Only European banks are affected by the uh, rule change uh, scheduled to go into effect June 28th, not the American or British banks. Uh, British banks are set to implement the rule uh, next January 1st, and in the United States, uh, the rule is effective next month, though the large banks don't have to publicly disclose their NSF ratio levels until 2023. Uh, by the way, uh, many countries are, have already complied with this new standard, notably Australia, Brazil, China, India, excuse me, Indonesia, and Russia. Uh, the major Western powers, the United States, Great Britain, and Europe, are behind them in, in implementing this rule. It's important to note that the NSF ratio is only one aspect of, of Basel III. The card includes a lot of other bank, uh, banking regulations as well, and those rules have different implementation dates. By the way, this is, this is significant. Uh, Basel III is a voluntary uh, regulatory framework. framework. Uh, the rules aren't legally binding. It's up to banking authorities in each country to implement them. Uh, the, uh, the Accord's implementa implementation dates have repeatedly, as you mentioned, been postponed since the standards were proposed and finalized in uh, 2014 and 2017, respectively. Last year, because of COVID, 
uh, the overall implementation date was extended once year, one year uh, once again to January 1st, 2023. If that deadline is met, uh, the banking pack will be phased in over five years through 2028, a full 20 years after the financial crisis the standards were designed to address. When it comes to regulation, the central banks move very, very slowly. And there's no doubt more, more uh, deferrals uh, of the deadlines are not out of the question. I hope that answers right. the question. Yeah, I think we've got now a good quick overview of what's going on here and hopefully people are starting to understand. I want to move on to talking about how this impacts the gold market because that's obviously what we're most concerned about here. So from my understanding, we've got a couple of things happening. We have gold becoming a tier one or risk-free asset for banks, but that only applies to physical gold. Um, only applies to physical gold that's actually held in bank vault. So can you explain how the implications differ for physical and paper gold here? Sure, I, I will try. Well, if, if Basel yeah. III is fully implemented and adhered to, uh, more banks should want to hold physical gold as an asset, as opposed to selling, leasing, swapping, or trading the un unallocated metal or paper derivatives that are now used to, to manipulate the gold price. Under the card, physical or alloc allocated gold is classified as a risk-free or zero uh, risk asset, as you mentioned. The same as cash, equivalent to, to cash. As an aside, I would argue that physical gold has less risk or downside than cash, um, who's, which, which loses purchasing power through inflation. Gold advocates have known this for a long time. They also know that physical gold has no counterparty risk, but it certainly is nice that the central banks are acknowledging the intrinsic and monetary value of physical gold. Now, contrary to the allocated or physical gold, un unallocated or paper, paper gold does carry counterparty risk and can be a liability. That's why this NSF ratio rule requires bullion banks to hold funds covering 85% of the value of the unallocated gold that they hold for their customers. The London uh, Bullion Market Association, also known as the BLMA, BM, <laughs> excuse me, BM, uh, LBMA, excuse me, and the World Gold Council have objected to this rule change. They claim it will negatively impact the gold market, increase the cost of dealing in unallocated gold, and reduce financing for gold miners and refiners. We'll have to wait and see if the BIS caves in to pressure from the LBMA and Royal Gold Council. So far, they haven't, at least not publicly. Uh, since the regulations are voluntary, the rule change is, is tenuous even toothless, if you will, uh, as it attempts to rein in unregulated uh, financial derivatives. Uh, Basel III recognizes that unallocated or paper gold, and, and likely also silver, pose systemic risk to the global banking and financial system. As with alcoholism, uh, the first step to recovery is accepting you have a problem. And the banking system has a big problem with financial derivatives. I once heard uh, derivatives, derivatives described as debt used as collateral to assume more debt. However, they're described uh, pyramiding debt to trade paper or imaginary metal. Sounds like a, re a recipe for disaster to me. All right. So I think the next step for us is to take a look at, at what this could mean for the gold price itself. And I know if you Google Basel III, you'll find any number of articles telling you that the gold price is going to go way up. It's going to go great. So what are your thoughts there? Can you help us understand what the impact might actually be? Because I don't know if I don't know if that much higher price is going to be realistic. Yes, there are different opinions on this. Um, if the rules are fully implemented and adhered to, 
it could end precious metals manipulation, increase physical demand, and boost the gold price. If that happens, who wouldn't want to hold gold, especially as currencies lose purchasing power through inflation? I hope the central banks are ready to come clean and end the fraud in the global monetary system by imposing some stringent accounting rules and capital requirements. Maybe they will, but I wouldn't bank on it. Um, for decades, the Bureau of, of the, excuse me, the Bank of International Settlements has helped central banks intervene in the gold market, allowing the price to be contained and manipulated lower. It all comes back to this issue of allocated versus unallocated gold. When gold is allocated, it has a, it, it has a specific titled owner. When it's unallocated, numerous individuals or entities can lay claim to the same ounce of metal. Right now, the central and bullion banks maintain a paper or fractional reserves system in gold in which the same ounce can be leased or swapped numerous times. It's an accounting trick that allows multiple, multiple entities to claim they own the same ounce of gold when that's impossible. If ownership of a single ounce of gold is claimed by multiple entities, how can it be considered an asset on multiple balance sheets? If Basel III is fully implemented and adhered to, the manipulation and accounting fraud could end. Market analyst uh, Alistair McLeod, you, who you're probably familiar with, uh, believes the new Basel III rules will end uh, precious metals manipulation by making it too costly for banks to rig prices with unallocated or imaginary, I mean, imaginary gold on the COMEX in New York and the LBMA in London. And I certainly hope he's correct. On the other hand, Chris Powell, Secretary Treasurer of the Gold Antitrust Action Committee, which has documented precious, precious metals manipulation for more than 20 years, speculates central banks could find other ways to continue to suppress the gold price. Powell suggests central banks could grant waivers to certain uh, banks or funnel money to bullion banks to cover the additional cost of shorting metals and dealing in unallocated gold. Regardless, uh, McLeod and Powell both make plausible points. The truth may lie somewhere in between. I believe market manipulation eventually will end. It must end, though it may continue for a while longer, depending on if the world's central banks are ready for it to end. This is something I suppose uh, the world central bankers don't even, even agree upon. Okay, so definitely this is a lot of information for people to take in. If you're an investor, what should you be doing at this point? How should you prepare? What should your approach be knowing that these things are going on? Sure. Well, I, I myself, uh, as, as well as I suggest other gold investors do, they should watch what the central banks do rather than believe what central bankers are saying. Uh, like politicians, uh, the central bankers often use doublespeak and disinformation to distract from what they're actually doing. The world's central banks claim to hold 35,000 tons of physical gold. And if that's true, that means gold remains money. Uh, a financial backstop, if you will, and sound investment in, in a fragile financial and monetary system. Gold also serves as an inflation hedge. Uh, Federal Reserve Ch uh, Chairman F uh, Jerome Powell recently said inflation is transitory. Well, that claim is absolute bunk, okay? Nonsense. Uh, inflation isn't uh, transitory it's ever present in this debt-based monetary system we have. It's baked into the Federal Reserve's fiat cake. The Fed creates monetary inflation by conjuring 
currency, which are known as Federal Reserve notes, out of thin air, which ultimately leads to higher consumer prices. The Fed desires and needs inflation to inflate these perpetual economic bubbles that we've seen over the last couple of decades. The Fed used to target 2% uh, annual inflation rate. Now it wants even higher inflation. Treasury Secretary and former Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen recently told Bloomberg News, we've been fighting inflation that's too low for decades. Too low for whom? Too low for the central bankers like Powell and Yellen, I suppose, but not for consumers who are who have seen their wages stagnant, you know, or on fixed incomes. Based on comments like that, you know, I'm not convinced that the central banks and bankers can hold themselves accountable. Even if Basel III is fully implemented by 2028, which will have been 20 years since the last major financial crisis, I predict we'll see another banking crisis or financial pa panic before then, likely requiring a Basel IV, if you will. Yes, Basel III could be a game changer. It could. Or it could be simply another bogus attempt by the central bankers to extend and pretend that they've got everything under control. And all is well in, in the financial world. Internal disagreements certainly exist between the world's central banks. Not all central bankers see eye to eye. Some want to change the monetary world order. Um, China and Russia, for instance, in 2009, called for a new global currency to replace the US dollar. Both had been accumula accumulating gold, massive quantities, tonnages of gold, along with more than a do dozen other nations. Other countries, notably the United States and Great Britain, want to maintain the status quo until they're ready to transition to a, a digital currency or a new monetary system to their liking. That's because most precious metal rigging occurs on the COMEX in New York and the LBMA in London. The question remains, what does Europe want? Will they side with the West or the East in these monetary matters that we're, we're speaking about? We may have gotten a clue from the G7 meeting a couple of weeks ago. During a news conference, French President Emmanuel uh, Macron suggested gold be sold to provide financial aid to Africa. That intrigued me. Many African nations have gold, resource, gold resources. Some of them have large gold resources. They could provide their own financial aid if the gold price were higher. If gold is a tier one asset equivalent to cash, why didn't Macron propose aid in the form of euros, dollars, pounds, or yen, which can be created out of thin air? Better yet, why didn't Macron propose that Africa extract its own gold resources and the price of gold be raised to aid Africa? Was Macron trying to jawbone the, the price of gold lower or offering central banks another way to tamp down the price? I guess we'll have to wait and see if the G7 banks buy or say sell gold in the near future. Okay, really interesting stuff. And thank you for going through this with us. As we're finishing up here, I would just ask if you have any final thoughts that you would want to leave the audience with about Basel III and or gold. Well, I, I just have to reiterate, watch what the bankers do, not what they mm -hmm. say. There's a whole lot of double speak. Uh, they say a whole lot of things, but it off, off it doesn't make sense to the average person. And uh, I think gold, the fact that the, the central bankers hold large quantities of gold, or at least claim to, is an indication that gold has real value and, and virtue in the monetary system. All right. Well, that sounds like a good place to leave it. Thank you so much for coming on to help us work through this. Hope to do it again sometime and get an update on the future. 
Thanks so much, Charlotte, for your invite to uh, INN. Once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and this is Stuart Englert.